Good morning, everyone. This is Iyad Murtada, and I would like to thank you very much for coming here today. Uh, on behalf of uh, the IMA du uh, Dubai chapter and on behalf of Open Thinking, uh, we are going to do this uh, webinar today to cover, you know, the main concepts related to uh, CMA Part 1. We are going to cover, you know, in general, a very quick overview of all the topics in the four sections. So uh, as, as for me, I uh, work uh, with the IMA Dubai chapter. I am on the board of directors as VB for CMA. So I support all the people who are studying CMA in uh, Dubai and UAE. Okay, so uh, quickly, uh, we have four subjects that, you know, in the CMA part one, which is uh, budgeting, we have costing, we have you know, performance measurement, and we have internal control. So let's start with budgeting. When we are speaking about budget, what is the definition of a budget? It's an operational plan and control tool that identify resources and commitment needed to satisfy goals and over a period of time. When we say the budget, it's all about using the resources for us to be able to budget. What are the expenses that we are going to have? What is the revenue that we are going to have? And based on it, we will be able to understand how can we use these, you know, uh, how can we manage these expenses and get this revenue for us to be able to achieve our goals. When we speak about budget, budgeting is a planning tool. We say it's a written plan. It will anticipate the problem. Managers are proactive rather than reactive, defining the goals in quantitative terms. So it's a planning tool. Budgeting can be used as a control tool, setting goals guidelines. Managers will understand the budgeted cost of their departments, um, measures the performance against established goals, and personal self-evaluation tool. And it will help them in avoiding budgetary slack, which is we are going to get into later. We say budget is a motivational tool, motivating employees to stay within the budget, right? They will motivate them and say, okay, this is what you need to do must be seen as a realistic budget, uh, not a restriction. So it's not like you're saying this is the limit. No, this is the budget. This is what we are thinking about. Try to be in that range. Some degree of flexibility is allowed. When we are speaking about budget as a communication tool, we are saying communicating the goals. When you are putting a budget, you are communicating to the employees that these are the goals that we are trying to achieve. And this is, these are the resources or these are the costs related to it. Making everyone in the organization working toward the goals also is really important because they are going to communicate and understand each one how much cost they have in their operation for them to be able to accomplish the goal. Now, budget, we can say it's a coordination tool, motivating departments to communicate and coordinate their work to be able to create a budget. So it's a coordination between all these departments trying to figure out how they are going to split the budget between them. Now, we say to prepare a successful budget, we need to align with corporate strategy used uh, to allocate resources effectively used as a planning, communication, coordinating, and motivation tool, and buy in at all levels. So all the people in the organization should support this, top management, middle management, and the employees. Now, there are so many factors that will affect the budget. We co call them, you know, uh, they are controllable cost and non-controllable cost. So it's all about controllability. So is the thing that you are telling the manager, please make sure that you reduce the cost to this level. Can he control the cost? For example, if you are telling an airline company, uh, uh, you need to make sure that you are not, you know, over uh, the budget related to the uh, to the oil that you are using in your flights. Well, the price of the oil is moving up and down. It's not under their control. So in that way, we need to understand this is not controllable cost. And what other kind of controllable cost they, they are responsible on, they need to measure. When we look at, you know, a, a broad strategic perspective for planning, the first thing, the organization, they have the mission statement. Then they have the strategic plan. Then they put the long-term objectives, which is here we'll focus on the capital investment. What kind of money they are putting, buying machines, doing investment, opening new branches, and all this is related to capital budgeting. They need to get some cash in the business for them to go and do a long-term, you know, investment. After that, we look at the short-term objectives related to current investment. What kind of expenses they are going to have every month, every year for them to be able to operate the business. And here where it comes related to operating budget. Now, for budget periods, we have different uh, time. We have long term and we have short term. So for a long term, we have strategic, you know, 10 to 2 years. We have intermediate 2 to 1 year and we have operational, less than 1 year. When we look at the budgeting, it can be top down, authoritative from the top to the bottom, or it can be what participative, bottom up. At the same time, when we look at the budget participants, who are they? The board of directors, senior management, budget committee, budget coordinator, middle and lower management. All of them, they participate in the preparation of the budget. When we look at budgetary slack, what is budgetary slack? 
See, it's the difference between the amount budgeted and the amount needed. So managers, they try to put the amount budgeted more than the amount needed. So in that way, if they got a little bit uh, more cost, they will feel like they are under budget. So we say manager can under um, uh, estimate the amount of income or revenue they will come in over a given amount of time or overstate. See, don't forget about that. Overstate the expenses that they are to be paid over the same period of time. This will create budgetary slack, which is, should see, this is the definition, the excess of amount budgeted over the actual amount needed. So if they ask you in an essay question, what is the budget is like, this is how you need to define it. Excess of amount budgeted over the actual need. So you say just the difference between how much budgeted and how much needed. Now there are some advantages and disadvantages for budgetary stack. The first thing we are saying advantages provide flexibility for operating uh, under unknown circumstances, right? If we don't know, so that way we have some slack we can go with. Offset the co costly setup for design change and a small lot of size orders. So in that way, sometimes, you know, when we are working with different, you know, products, we are going to have some over budget items. So budget stack will help us in making sure that we are in, in the fine range. When we look at the disadvantages, decreases the ability to highlight weaknesses and take timely corrective action or problem. If we have budget stack, we don't really know if you know, we are achieving the cost or not because each manager is pushing up a little bit to the, their budget. So it looks like they are always fine under the budget. Decrease the overall effectiveness of corporate planning. See, we don't have planning anymore because everyone is putting whatever budget they think they need, actual, not actually they need. It limits the objective evaluation. See, we can't evaluate them anymore because their performance is based on meeting the budget. Now, if they are putting all these budgets, it's like all the time they will meet it. The budget and in that case how can we really make sure that they are really performing in the right way so these are the main concepts now when we go to, uh, relate to move to costing a little bit so we we are saying the cost standards you know it's uh, it's really important to for us to establish them how much an operation or a service should cost we say there are so many ways for us to look at the cost it can be authoritative or participative the top management will say this is the cost or the participant will say this is the cost or it can be ideal or, re or realistic. We'll say, no, the cost for you to take a taxi from this location to this location is $20. Or they say, no, the cost for you to take this taxi from here to here, it can range between you know, $15 to $25, depends on the traffic. See, so which kind of uh, standard are we putting in the operation? Now, when we uh, uh, try to understand the cost standards, we need to look at the co standard cost for direct material. And for us, when we need to do it for direct material, we need to do the following. First, we need to look at the quality. See, it's not the quantity, it's not the price. We look at the quality. What is the quality of, you know, the direct material that we are getting? So this is a very important item for us to look at before we move to another thing. Then we look at the quantity. How much are we ordering? If we are ordering a lot, that's going to reduce the price. And then we look at the price. See, if it is, is it competitive? After that, when we look at the standard cost for direct labor, we need to understand exactly, you know, who are these tapers, how much they charge an, an hour. And after that, you know, we have different ways for us to estimate how much the standard costs for direct material, direct labor, or any other costs by doing different methods. We can use activity analysis. So we say, we tell the worker, okay, do uh, this product, work on it. And we say, oh, you spend two and a half hours. So two and a half hour multiply by your rate, this will give us for example, $50, and this $50 will represent how much direct material cost we need for each one unit. So when we're speaking about cost standards, we are trying to understand how much the cost of direct material, direct labor, and other costs related to each one unit of output. See, this is the main focus. Now, the other thing, we can use historical data. We say, okay, what happened last year? How much we were charging last year? We can use the same thing. Or market expectation or strategic direction. How much actually is happening in the market? Or benchmark. We look at other in, in, uh, you know, companies in the same industry and how much they are charging and benchmark based on it and decide that cost for us. So these are really important concepts for you to understand to be able to move to work on you know, the different cost. Uh, after that, when we are looking at the budget and we are trying to plan the budget, what we need to do? We need to look at the operational budget here. We are going to move to capital budgeting in part two. But here, when we look at operational budget, it's like this. We start with the sales budget. How much are we expecting to sell? Then how much are we expecting to produce? Then how much are we expecting to buy direct material? How much labor we need? How much manufacturing overhead? Then how much cash we need for us to be able to do this? 
and after that how much ending finished good we are going to have and how much the selling administrative expenses that we are going to have and that will determine my budget and financial state so let's go over a quick example here here is the example we are saying this is the budget it says for october november december and january and we are saying the selling price is ten dollars so we start this is the budget it says we say budget it says these are the units that we got from the other slide multiply by the selling price that would give me the total budget it says perfect now the production what they are saying management want to end the inventory 20 percent of the following month and this is how much we had in september so we start we say this is how much do you know we are gonna sell in each month this is how much the desired inventory and this is how much actually needed so this is how much we need to have and after that this is how much we had at the beginning so the required production is 2600 the same thing we do it for the other one how much we need by the end of the period this is how much we need to produce after that how much we had so they will get us how much we need to produce in this month the same thing will go now for direct material budget we are saying 10 pound of materials are required per unit of product on the hand at the end of each month uh, we, we need to have 10 percent equal of the you know the following month and we are saying for september 2000 pounds of material are on hand the material will cost you know 20 cents per pound so we need to figure out you know what is the standard cost we are saying we need 10 pounds multiplied by 0 0.2 so that will give us two dollars so what will happen first we decide what is the production so we take it from the previous one what is the production after that we say perfect what is the material per unit we put it down see we need 10 that would give us how much production needed after that how much actually we need at the end of the period and that we say this 10 percent out of november so it's you know it's 10 percent out of the 46 thousand this will give us how much total needed we need to get now but don't forget we already have in our inventory 2000 so that will end up with just you know uh, 28600 this is how much actually we need now if we look at it and for the other month it's the same process now direct labor we are saying each unit of product required 0.5 hours which is 30 minutes of direct labor workers agree see to a wage rate of one dollar per hour regardless of the hours worked so it's great so in that way we know exactly how how many hours we need and we know how much we are going to pay them so we go with the same thing how much production are we going to have how much labor we have half hour what is the total labor hours what is their you know rate and that would determine for us you know the cost for them so this is really uh, interesting did you see the equation here we say direct labor cost equals to unit produced multiplied by hours of direct labor per unit multiplied by the average cost per labor manufacturing overhead we are saying for overhead is applied to to, to units of product on the basis of direct labor hours the uh, variable manufacturing overhead is two dollars per direct labor and we're saying fixed manufacturing overhead is you know three thousand three hundred fifty perfect so we put all the information this is how much direct labor we need right we said manufacturing overhead is based on direct labor we say this is how much variable rate which is two 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 we say this is how much do you know we are going to need to cover the cost for our variable overhead we add to it the fixed overhead that will give us the total overhead cost that we need to have so this is you know uh, really important next we say okay now what about finished goods well for us to understand finished goods first we need to understand what is the actual cost of the product so we say we know we know how much direct material will cost we know how the direct labor will cost and after that how much manufacturing overhead will cost based you know on uh, our calculation we'll be able to figure it out and how did we do that we took the total manufacturing overhead for the quarter and we say how much total labor hours required that will give us how much you know the rate for overhead and in that way we put all this information together we say okay how many units we have in the ending inventory multiplied by the cost of the unit that will tell us what is the ending inventory you know uh, on our balance sheet and after that we are saying selling administrative expenses we are going to have you know variable selling administrative expenses we are going to have fixed selling administrative expenses and you know the, the fix will include uh, you know uh, about like 10,000 primary depreciation that are not cash uh, uh, outflow of the current month. So what we say, the same thing. We put all the information here. We say this is, you know, the budget it says, the variable sales, 
all this information we add all this information together in the same thing this is how much it, budget it says this is how much the variable cost that will give us the variable selling administrative we add with the fixed cost that will give us the total less than the non-cash you know expenses which is just the depreciation that will give us how much actually cash we are going to spend on selling administrative expenses so once once we put everything together it's like this we have the operating uh, you know we have the sales budget it's giving us the same administrative cost and uh, giving us the production uh, you know requirement the production requirement is telling us how much cash we need to budget for direct material direct labor and manufacturer overhead that all will move to the cash budget and from it we'll be able to get the budgeted income statement and the budgeted balance sheet so now we are gonna stop here we're not gonna move to uh, to this section and after that we are going to go to a different part of the presentation okay great so i have it here i hope you are following with me fine so now let's go over cost accumulation uh, so what we are going to do first, we are going to uh, cover cost accumulation, and after that, we are going to fo focus on cost allocation. So you know, the cost I, I love to work with cost so much because what will happen with cost, and you know, many uh, you know cost accountants they know that that first we try to identify the cost. So we identify it, we start to budget. So we budget, and after that, we start running the operation. So what will happen? Cost will start accumulating, accumulating. So we are trying to uh, accumulate all these costs. And after that, we are allocating, allocating this cost. And after that, we are doing, doing performance measurement. So, you know, the CMA is covered in a really nice way where it's going, you know, over, you know, budget, accumulated, allocated, and after that, measured. So, um, I like that approach. It's really uh, nice when you look at it from this perspective. So, let me make this a little bit smaller so you'll be able to see it fine. I think I need to make Okay. Okay. So here, the, when we are speaking about uh, cost uh, accumulation, these are the, you know the topics that we focus on, right? So we focus on job order costing, we focus on process costing, we focus on transactional costing, we focus on activity based cost. So it's really important for us, you know, to to quickly cover all these main concepts. So I'm just moving here out of this presentation. So the first thing we are saying is job order costing. Many different products are produced each period. Uh, products are manufactured to order, right? Costs are traced or allocated to jobs. Cost records must be maintained for each dist uh, distinct job and typical job order cost. So it's like a special order or building construction. You know, you build a hotel, you build a hospital. Each project is different. So with job ordering cost, we are trying to understand how much is the cost for each one of these projects. So in that way, we'll be able to really you know, invoice the client based on the cost. Otherwise, we don't know how much it's costing us to do or any of these projects. And usually these are different projects. So how that will happen for direct material? Well, we take the direct material and we start allocating how much direct material are we using for each one of these jobs. And that way we charge direct material cost to each job directly for us to be able to understand how much direct material cost we are going to have. Perfect. Then when we look at what? When we look at you know how it's going to be recorded in the accounting books, so we say raw materials needs to move from raw materials to work in process, right? We use these raw materials, we move it from raw materials to work in process. And after that, we need to move raw materials that indirect to manufacturing overhead because this is not directly traced to this job. You know, there are some raw materials lost during the process between all these projects. So in that way, we say we just move it to manufacturing over. Now, when we look at direct labor, the same thing. All these laborers who are working on the project, they need to sign timesheets and they need to say, okay, I allocated three hours, two hours, five hours for each one of these projects. So in that way, we'll be able to understand how much, you know, it was costing us to use these laborers for each one of these projects. And after that, when we look at, you know, on how we are going to charge that. So when we look at the labor here, what we are saying, we are saying for the labor, the work in process, you know, need to be debited, and after that, we need to credit what wage payable. So we are moving the cost of the labor from the wages to what to work in process. And at the same time, any laborers who are in between, you know, traveling, there are all these indirect, uh, you know, costs for our laborers. We move it to manufacturing overhead in the same way that we did for direct material. 
when we move and we look at you know indirect cost so for indirect cost now what we need to do we need to take the factory overhead we need to take any overhead that we have and we need to go and locate some cost based on some driver to each job or each order that we have and how can we do this we need to apply the overhead for each job using predetermined rate and how can we get the predetermined rate where well, it's not that difficult we say the predetermined rate overhead is the estimated total overhead how much are we estimating overhead over the driver over the estimated total unit in the allocation base so on that way based on that we will determine exactly how much we need to allocate and we say the overhead applied see how can we apply it for each job we say how much is the predetermined overhead rate that we took five dollars ten dollars whatever multiply by how much actually we used so is it based on labor outcome whatever it's based on how much actually it is in this job and based on it we will allocate and at the end what will happen we take the this manufacturing overhead that we decide that this is related to this job and we go and transfer all this cost to work in process so this is you know how we will be able to to transfer it. which is you know it's a really great way we are looking at direct material direct labor direct cost and uh, direct, uh, manufacture overhead and after that you know moving all this to work in process so what will happen now we look at the actual overhead so for actual overhead you'll be like what do you mean actual overhead we were just speaking about overhead yeah that overhead that we were speaking about it's the applied one so what happened you decided that you know this is how much we should apply why because actually we didn't get all the invoices we don't know all the overhead but what will happen after that manufacturing overhead we need to be you know debited for all the costs that happen for all the actual accounts payable for all the actual you know cost for actual insurance so we need to allocate all this directly to be able to understand how much actually we had overhead and then we are saying when the job is completed what we need to do we need to work all the uh, move all the work in process right it's finished no work on process anymore they are finished goods we need to move them to finished goods so in that way that will be uh, you know our finished goods that after that we need to sell and once we sell what will happen we look at the cost of goods sold so after that when it's sold we say when the output is sold we go debit cost of of, uh, of goods sold and after that we credit what finished goods so in that way we don't have the goods anymore we sold them now what will happen we're saying at the end of the period the overhead control uh, 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 do we have overhead uh, 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 and we have the overhead control and we have the applied account so remember we said this is how much we applied let's say we applied ten thousand dollars to this project but actually the actual overhead was eight thousand oh we applied more than we should have so that way we need to change it so what they say if the result is a credit so in that way what we need to do we need to go and see if they are over applied or under applied we are saying if the result is debt over uh, overhead or under applied see if the result is a credit so in that way it's over applied if the result is debit so in that way it's under applied so we are saying if it's material immaterial we close it directly to cost of goods sold so if it's material we say okay that's it we just allocate it to cost of goods sold so we reduce or increase cost of goods sold depends on it. but if it's material we need to really allocate it to working process to finish good to cost of goods sold so this is you know showing you if the balance is material the amount is allocated to all these because we need to say how much work in process how much finished good how much cost of good sold we allocate if the amount is not material directly we uh, take it to the cost of good sold now over uh, applied and under applied look how this concept is saying this is manufacturing overhead this is how much we actually we had 650 but the the applied one 680 so in that way we have over applied so what we need to do we need to see how we take it and move it to cost of goods sold so that will reduce our cost of goods sold right because we already applied 680 but actually we should have applied 650 so we need to reduce the cost of goods sold by 30,000. just remember this if the overhead is under applied applied overhead is less than the actual so uh, uh, assume no material increase and uh, no, uh, no material so what we are saying in, if it's not material we are saying increase cost of goods sold we are saying it's, if it's overhead applied overhead is greater than the actual if it's uh, if it's not material we say what decrease in cost of goods sold so just remember 
when it's under applied we need to increase cost of goods sold right we under applied so cost of goods sold need to incre be increased to reflect the right one when we are over applied we made more than we should have to we need to decrease the cost of goods sold so just remember that you know definitely you are going to get a question about it in the cmx okay and this is just showing you you know the movement that see we have raw material uh wage babel we have manufacturing overhead and they are showing you that you know that raw material and the wages they are moving to work in process the over uh, the manufacturer overhead applied move there and after that we move to finished goods then we compare how much we applied compared to how much we have so when we are looking at job order costing we have a spoilage and we need to understand what to do with them if they are normal spoilage do you know what we do we say okay spoiled inventory and we move them to work in process because they are normal they are part of the operation if they are abnormal if we say okay loss so in that way what will happen we say okay we are going to have a loss and we are going to move it out of the working process now we say if they are abnormal and they can be sold you know we have some items but we can sell them 10 percent discounted or 50 percent or 90 percent so we say what will happen we say we have inventory now and this is the value for it and we, we and you know uh, credit uh, work in process so we take them out of the work process and we put the difference between how much we took out of work on process compared to how much we'll be able to sell them as a loss from abnormal spoilage. So this is the way for us to handle spoilage. Definitely spoilage, they love to ask a question about it. So you are going to get a question like this uh, in the exam. And these are some uh, videos. We're not going to move over them. Okay, so this is we cover the job uh, uh, cost. Usually, I don't know, you spend uh, an hour and a half in the class. Uh, we just finished it in less than uh, five minutes. Okay, uh, process costing. So now we are moving to process costing. It's uh, applicable to uh, relative homogeneous products that are mass produced. It's, uh, you know, the average process that calculates the average cost per unit. So here we are producing, you know, Pepsi, Coca-Cola. We are producing homogeneous products. So in that way, it's easy for us to do it. Understand how much the cost for the production. Based on that, we define it on the number of outputs. So we are saying for direct material, we are using, you know, for the first department, this is the first department, all the raw material, we allocate it to working process, easy. And after that, see, we allocate all the other costs directly to working process. So there is no sense here. Then we say, okay, after that, what we need to do? We need to allocate from one department to another. So now we are looking at the production, right? It's a, it's a manufacturing company. From each department to another department, we'll go allocate the working process for department A to working process in department B. And after that, all the additional raw material and all additional work for department B will be allocated to working process. And at the end, when we finish, what will happen? The last department will go allocate all these costs to finished goods. And when we sell the items, we go allocate all these costs from finished goods to cost of goods sold. It's a very straightforward, you know, process costing is not as complicated as any other method and it's focusing more on the production. But the issue here, we need to understand, you know, what is the equivalent unit? Uh, when you are producing two cars, but you actually finish half of the first car and half of the other car, we can say from accounting standpoint that we have approximately one car finished. See, it's not a reality, but this is how we look at it in accounting to make it easy for us to understand how much you know uh, we already have in our working process what is the percentage of the finished goods so we say equivalent unit in, in a concept that converts a number of partially completed units to smaller number of fully completed units so this is you know the main uh, concept of it. so two one half full uh, you know cups maybe we can say are equivalent to you know one full cup so with the process costing we need to use this equivalent way and we can use weighted average method and we are we can use first in first out method so one one of these methods i'm not going to go over the details here you should understand this but I'm, it's just really important to understand this and cost per equivalent unit this is how we measure it we say a product cost for the period over equivalent unit for the period so how much to understand how much actually the products were costing us during this period we can say we have half products finished we say how much the cost for the period compared to you know how much equivalent unit we finish during this period and this will determine for us exactly you know how much the actual cost that will be so like i said i'm not going to go over all these details related to, to how it will be and how it's measured you know you should uh understand that or like you know get an idea of it. 
Okay, so now let's move to when we speak about, you know, traditional cost. So traditional costing, we say it, it's like peanut butter costing, you know. We are taking this cost and we are spreading this cost all over. So everything is getting the same cost. And sometimes we feel like this is not appropriate. Imagine, so for example, Pepsi company. They are producing Pepsi and Diet Pepsi, and they are producing, you know, 7-Up maybe, and they are producing all these other, you know, products. And what will happen? You say, yeah, for Diet Pepsi, we are not using sugar. Why are we allocating some cost related to the sugar there? Or why are we allocating other costs here? So in that way, see, we don't spread all the costs around. We need to be able to say how much is the cost for this production, for this activity, see, activity. What kind of drivers are driving the cost of each production, of each activity, and based on it, we decide this. So in that way, it's not about spreading the cost all over, but uh, rather understanding, you know, what kind of activities and how this happens. So look at it here. We look at the traditional way, and we say, oh my God, we look at all the accounts, we put them in one cost pool, and after that, we spread it all over. Oh my God, that's, is, is this really nice? Is this volume-based system? Is really giving us the accurate results if you are producing different items? And the answer is no. And why is no? What happened for us to move from this traditional method of applying, you know, all the costs directly to the unit to the new method, right? This is what happened. It's an increase in automation. The increase of automation increased our overhead. So for any production now, we are using machine. We are using, you know, automated system. And that made the cost structure change. We have 80%, 70%, some companies 90% of their cost is the overhead. So if your major cost is the overhead, it's really important to understand which item in your overhead is creating the cost for the product or you know the activity that you are doing. So how can we do this? We need to look at the expense per department allocated to the cost of the activity and after that allocated to the cost of the object of the product that you are doing. And these are the three steps that we need to follow. Identify organization activities, assigning the cost of resource consumed by the activity, assigning the cost of uh, 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 of the actives to the final you know, cost uh, object. So this is you know, really uh, important. Then, this is the, look how we look at the first step, activity analysis. What kind of activities are we doing? So we analyze the activity. We say we are doing activity one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, perfect. Then, see, so these are the activities that we are doing. We have different activities, and each activity got different level. We have unit production. We have setup for the machines, right? To produce coke. After that, to produce diet coke. We need to do the setup. After that, we what kind of resources are we using? So when we are using the you know, machine hours, we are using cycles. We are using labors. We are using accounting. Uh, so all this needs to be defined, so that way we understand what are you know the activities that we are looking at, and at the same time, what kind of cost we are trying to allocate. And this step two will happen. See, we assign, this is the first activity pool. This is the second activity pool. And see, these are our resources. We are now dividing our resources in different, you know, uh, boxes. And all these boxes will, will help us later and understand what will happen. And then we allocate, what are the drivers? Okay, this machine, how are we saying, okay, what is the cost related to it? So for this machine, we are always doing setup, 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 setup. So in that way, each setup will represent certain cost. We need to understand how much this costs, so we know for Coke, how many setup we did three, for, for example, another product, water, how much setup we did two. So we allocate the cost based on that. And then what will happen, if we go down, that's what will happen. We go and take these activity cost pools and we go and allocate the cost to the cost object, see? Because now we understand exactly, you know, what are the cost drivers that we are looking at. So if we look at it in general, this is what will happen. We take our resources, we put all the resources that we have in and assign the drivers for them. And based on it, we look at the activities, what kind of activities and what kind of resources we need. Based on the resources drivers, we allocate the cost to these activities. And after that, we look at the activity drivers for each production of each one of these units, how much activity driver we had used and based on it, we determine the cost for us. So this is, you know, this is our way of looking at it. Perfect. So this is activity-based costing. Uh, you need to go in more details to get an idea on how to apply it, but this is general. Here again, 
We have the first stage when we look direct material, direct labor, you know, sh shipping costs, overhead costs. We take it and we go and apply, see, just the overhead cost. We are looking at the overhead cost. We apply it to, you know, what is the labor, material, setup, production, and general factory. And after that, we go and apply, you know, based on the factors, how many direct labor we use, how many machine we use, how many setup we use. And in that way, we will understand it if we are looking at a batch or unit lift. So this will help us understand you know, exactly how much the cost is allocated. And this is a, another way for looking at it. See, we take all these costs from different factors. We put them in one activity pool, and after that, we assign them to understand exactly you know, how much the actual cost that we have. It's really important for you to understand activity-based costing. They love to ask a question about it in the exam. And after that, when we look at the evaluation of activity-based costing, we need to understand, you know, the benefit of activity-based costing, improve the accuracy and uh, of product uh, product cost, uh, activity cost of uh, pools are more homogeneous than department cost pools. Overhead is allocated on the basis of activity that cause the overhead. Limitation of activity-based costing, the cost of implement uh, implementation may exceed the benefit, may not be in conformance with the gap. So these are, you know, some of the limitations for it. Process value analysis, I'm not going to go so much over that, but you need to understand in, the, in this case, what kind of activities in your operation are adding value and what kind of activities are not adding value and based on a decide which activity you need to keep, which activity you need to take out. Good, we finished now cost accumulation. So now let's go to cost allocation. You'll be like, interesting. So, you know, this cost accumulation, usually we spend, what, weeks trying to figure out what's happening. Here we are just trying to do it very quick overview. So now we are going to move to the second part. And I think this is going to take us another 10 minutes. And then we have about another seven minutes on uh, uh, cost variance, performance measures. And after that, we have about three minutes for internal control. And it. it's a very quick one. OK, cost allocation. So when we look at cost allocations, here's the uh, things that we look at. We look at obser uh, obser uh, observation. Uh, observation. So in that way, are we absorbing this cost or is it about the variable costing? See, so in that way, we look at the full costing compared to direct costing. What about the joint product compared to byproduct? What about overhead cost compared to normal and allocation of the service department? So let's go over them one by one. So when we look at, you know, absorption versus variable costing, you know this. For absorption, we say all the costs, see, all the costs related to Direct material, direct labor, variable manufacturing, fixed manufacturing, it's a product cost. And all the selling administrative, it's a period cost. This is how GAAP is requiring that. But variable costing, when we say, well, for managerial purposes, we don't really care about the fixed cost because it's happening anyway. Let's look at what is the product cost, which is the actual cost related to the variable you know, cost of the production. And let's look at the period cost is all the cost that's happening, like fixed cost and selling administrative expenses uh, during the period. So, you know, we use variable cost just for us to give us an indicator of how, you know, we are measuring the cost. And there are different perspectives saying all manufacturing costs must be assigned to product to probably match the revenue and cost. But another person will say, but fixed costs are not really the cost of a product, right? You have a rent. What is the relation between the rent and the product? You are going to pay it anyway if you produce or not. So there are certain arguments we need to understand why we are using it. But what he said depreciation, insurance, rent, and all this. They are essential part for uh, of production, and we say yes, but you know they are a, a capacity cost and will occur uh, if we don't have any production even. See, so these are again the arguments. So what we need to understand here, when we are looking at it, you need to understand that the main difference between them in the end net profit is the same difference between them in the ending inventory. So they will say, okay, if you are using absorption costing and if you are using you know, uh, variable costing. What is the difference in the ending inventory? Well, it's the same difference in the net uh, profit. Because what will happen if you are using variable costing? We are not going to go and allocate certain costs, right? We are not going to go and allocate them where? To the cost of the production. And so in that way, if we don't allocate it to the cost of production, we don't allocate it to the cost of goods sold. So if we sell these items, we actually, we still have, you know, this cost already expensed. In on the balance sheet, we didn't put it in the inventory. So again, if you are using absorption costing, the cost of production related to fixed manufacturing overhead is captured 
in the cost and that's going to be on the balance sheet with variable costing it's going to be expensed during the period so these are you know the main two things that we need to differentiate here okay so let's move on absorption and variable costing so here when we look at absorption and variable costing the same thing you need to look at you know when we are using absorption all the cost of manufacturing is going to be you know ending in in, in in the cost of the production and for variable cost just the variable cost we are going to consider them as cost of production so here is another example we are saying you know when production will increase what will happen uh, uh, when production in, is exceeding sales and in the inventory will expand so in that way under absorption we are going to have what some fixed costs are, are still embedded in the inventory under variable cost all fixed costs have been in, uh, you know uh, uh, expense so operating income is higher so just you know understand this when we are producing uh, more than we are selling and when we are using absorption cost and variable cost operating income is higher under the absorption cost the opposite side when we are looking at you know variable cost okay let's move on and these are you know more examples about it okay so uh, now we move to you know allocating joint uh, uh, product cost you need to understand these four, four methods which is really important so we have the physical measure base approach we have the market base approach which is you know focusing on sales volume at split off point uh we focus on estimated neutralized and after that we have the constant cost let's me quickly go over them physical measures very easy how much we produced how much is the cost we say for example we produced 5 10 10 perfect 25 how much is the cost we say okay we take this you know the whole the whole uh, uh, cost over this you know how many we much how much we produce and after that we figure out the cost for each item so it's a very easy thing think about it if you are doing you know making different sandwiches and you have certain you know cost for getting all these you know breads and we need to spread them you say okay for each uh, how many sandwiches we made for shawarma or for uh, you know chicken you say five five so in that way we need to allocate five of the cost of the bread to them right because we we just bought 100 uh, pieces of bread and we use them differently so it's a very easy way directly it's based on the physical you know measure now when we look at the other ones when we look at you know the sales value at the split of uh, it's easy how much are we selling these items for so you say okay for these sandwiches how much are we selling these sandwiches for how much are you selling the other sandwiches for and based on it we understand based on how much we are selling it for we'll be able to say okay we are going to cover part of the cost based on that percentage now net estimated net realized value here it's really more interesting it's not about you know, how much we are selling it for here we are going to have it at, after the split of point and after that we are going to do more production or more you know work on it and after that we are going to sell it later so it's going to have a final value and based on this we are we need to track that that back and say how much actually cost us for us to 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 uh, get all these items at the split of point based on how much the actual money that we made from selling these items i'm not going to go over the details here again you know you should understand this concept i'm just going over the main highlights so you you remember it okay so uh, byproduct when we are speaking about byproduct it's really important to understand what will happen for byproduct you know at the end we have some items that they come through the production we can sell them so in that way if we can sell them we say okay this is the selling price this is how much additional processing we need to do for them to be able to sell them and this is the selling cost and that would give me my neutralized value right so we need to understand in that case is it worth for us to go and work on them or not as long as we'll be able to generate money from selling them more than the cost that we are going to do for additional you know uh, manipulation or processing and any other cost related to the selling cost as long as the price is higher we'll be able to say yes let's do do that at the same time we need to understand if the amount is material we need to go back and we need to do what we need to look at at it as a finished good and we need to go and put this is the finished good inventory for all these items and based on it we will take them out of the working process because now these are not byproducts anymore these are you know they are sub products now when we look at overhead cost and normal costing we have overhead costing and we have you know fixed costing uh, this is when we do, are looking at manufacturing overhead and what will happen here mm -hmm. this is very interesting why is that 
because we look at the cost and we say some of them are variable some of them are fixed so in that way you know how can we really do the our estimation and what kind of, of, uh, of estimation we can use well we say we need to figure out the overhead rate and how can we figure out the overhead rate when actually the overhead didn't happen yet so what we need to do we need to figure out exactly the first thing you know how much estimation we think the overhead is going to be and how much you know units of output or you know any dri other driver we are estimating and we create a rate that we think this is a reasonable rate and after that like we said we go and multiply it by how much actual activity we had and that will determine you know the actual activity for us and then when we are looking at you know our estimation when we are using you know actual costing so everything actual and you'll be like, what do you mean? Well, if you are working as a consultant, you know everything actual. You know how much it's costing you to go to the client's office. You know how much, you know, how many hours you work on it. You know all this. So it's all actual. But sometimes we have normal costing. We know how much direct material, direct labor we have, but we don't have the overhead because we need to wait until the end of the month to get the bill. So we just budget for it. In some operation, we have no idea how much direct material we need, how much direct labor we need, or how much manufacturing overhead. So the best situation for us is to budget for it because we can't measure it directly on the spot. We need to do some analysis to come back to measure this. So this is important. Now allocating service departments. So we have services department that they are doing some work for you know other departments and in that way we consider it overhead. How are we going to do the allocation? So we say we, there are different methods for it. I'm just going to you know quickly go over them. So four criteria we look at cost and effect, benefit received and fairness and at the same time the ability to bear these are all important criteria to look at and you know one of the methods that we use you know it's what it's first stage allocation we go to look at all these services uh, product allocate all their costs to the departments and after that we take all these departments and allocate the cost to the products one of the methods that we use called direct method very easy take the service department allocate the cost to all the operating department and ignore the cost between the service departments we have step down method with a step down method we are saying okay we look at the service department that's providing the most services to all the other services department first we allocate the cost to the other services department from that department and to other operating departments and then we allocate the cost from the small services department to all the operating department ignoring the allocation back so this is you know when we look at step back method. there is the reciprocal method which is you know most likely sometimes it's used so in that way we are trying to allocate the cost between them by putting certain equations and just you know putting the number not going to go over the details here but you know this is another way for us to do this perfect we cover this so let's move back to our slide here so now in in, in the last uh, you know seven minutes what we are going to cover we are going to look at you know the cost variance so look what will happen we think that this is how much cost we are going to have based on the budgeted cost and after that we go do cost accumulation and cost, uh, cost allocation and we discover oh my god there are there's a cost variance because of two items this picture i love it because the our cost increased this is how much we budgeted but this is how much actual or because our quantity increased this is how much budgeted and this is how much actual so what we need to understand what is our cost variance what is our price variance what is our volume variance that will determine the cost variance that we have so it's a really important how can we do this look this is very easy and very direct so you say this is how much you know actual quantity multiplied by actual price this is the actual budget that we uh, budget that we came up during the production how much we estimated this is how much static quality and this is how much static price for me create in between flexible budget where i take the actual quantity from one side and take the standard price from one side and that will be in between so the difference between the static budget and the flexible budget is the quantity variance. The difference between the actual budget and the flexible budget, we call it the price variance. As simple as that. You go and apply the same concept on sales. You go apply it on direct material, direct labor. It's the same concept exactly. So here, see, we are applying on direct labor. The same concept. We are applying on manufacturing uh, overhead. The same concept. When we come to a very interesting thing, which is fixed overhead, so for fixed overhead, you can say, you know, <laughs> this is how much actual and this is how much we apply. And let's see something in between because it's a fixed. So what we do, we say, this is how much actual cost we apply. And this is how much, do you know, what we say, static flexible budget. This is how much we thought we should apply. See, so the difference between actual budget and static budget will give me the spending variance. We thought our, uh, you know, uh, 
a telephone bill is going to be uh, 400 dirhams, it was 450. So this is spending. We spend more. We use our cell phone more. But how much actually it should be? See how much actually it should be. So we say the allocated fixed overhead is the standard rate, how much they charge us per minute, by how much actually we you were using from our minutes. And that will determine the difference between how much we estimated we are going to have compared to how much, uh, uh, do you know, we think that we should have based on our level of output. And that will give me production volume and variance. So what's the meaning of it? That, look, our cost increased or decreased because of a volume rather than price change. See, so there we spend more. Maybe, you know, they are charging us more on over time because we went over our limit. But here it's focusing on, did we spend more minutes? And how many more minutes we spent? So this is really important. Now, when we look at responsibility centers, we need to look at that we have cost center, revenue center, profit center, investment center, cost fo center focusing only on cost, revenue only on revenue, profit is on cost and revenue, investment on cost, revenue and investments. Uh, it's really important to understand, you know, how the segments will be reported based on, you know, gap approach and contribution margin. Gap will use it for financial reporting, contribution margin for managerial measures. When we look at transfer pricing, it's really important to understand the different method. It's total cost plus percentage of cost. It's total cost plus profit, cost plus selling price. It's just the full absorption cost, direct material, direct labor, overhead, or variable cost, direct material, direct labor, overhead, and uh, or we have the final one, negotiation. And, you know, based on different policies in the organization, we can determine, you know, which factor is going to affect, you know, the uh, transfer pricing. Finally, when we are looking at scorecard, it's really important that you understand that we have financial scorecard, uh, uh, customer scorecard, learning and growth, and internal process. All of them will help us understand how are we achieving the vision and what strategy we need to work on to do that. When we look at internal control and internal auditing, it's really important to understand the COSO model, understand the prevention and detection co controls, understand you know what kind of controls are we implementing inside the organization to make sure that we prevent fraud from happening, we prevent mistakes from happening. At the same time, what kind of control we are putting there to capture and catch if something wrong went. What kind of information system controls are we putting? What kind of system and application controls? And when you think about system and application control, think about it like a process. It's an input control. So it's an input, all the items that's going inside the system. It's a processing, making sure that the items that are in the system are processed in the right way. And it's an output control, making sure that the items that are out of the system are protected and at the same time they are not manipulated. After that, we look at the internal auditor's role. The internal auditors, they play a very important role in making sure that the management are doing it in the right way. So they go and audit whatever the management is doing, ensuring that they have the internal control, they assess the risk, they understand exactly what you know uh, controls are implementing, making sure these controls are effective and give them feedback. So finally, if we look at the COSO model, we look at it at five items. Of course, this is the old one. We look at the cost, uh, the control environment. We look at the risk assessment, the control activity and monitoring. First, what control environment we have in the organization? Based on that, we understand, you know, the control, you know, culture. We understand, you know, what kind of controls the organization is implementing. Based on this, we be able to do risk assessment. Understanding what kind of risk the organization is facing, then we'll be able to see what kind of controls they are implementing, what kind of control activities they have to make sure that they are avoiding these risks. And are they monitoring, making sure that they, these controls are working effectively? And is there information and communication between the people to make sure you know that the flow of information and other items are there? Thank you very much. This is you know the end of our quick review. It was just you know about one hour covering all these items. Thank you very much.